had the peaceful campaign of the suffragists reached the end of its usefulness by 1900? Was Emmeline Pankhurst correct to say that now was the time for deeds, not words? It is true that by the 1880s, the women's suffrage movement looked to be losing momentum. Membership was in decline and all attempts to pass a women's suffrage bill in Parliament had failed. There are three main reasons why. First, Parliament had just passed the 1884 Third Reform Act, increasing the number of men who could vote. It therefore seemed unlikely that the government would revisit the question of electoral reform for some time. Second, women were being drawn away from single-issue suffrage societies into party organizations such as the Conservative Primrose League and the Women's Liberal Federation. By the early 1890s, the Primrose League had around half a million women members. Third, British politics at this time was dominated by the question of home rule for Ireland. This issue had badly split the Liberal Party, leaving the Conservatives to dominate the political scene. With the Liberals posing no immediate electoral threat, the Conservatives had no need to compete with them over electoral reform, as Gladstone and Disraeli had done in the 1860s. However, despite this challenging political environment, progress was being made. In Parliament, more and more MPs were becoming sympathetic to the idea of some form of women's suffrage, to the extent that three women's suffrage bills in 1897, 1904 and 1908 achieved majorities. They failed to become law not for want of votes, but due to the lack of parliamentary time, a stalling tactic used by the government. The historian Martin Pugh has argued that as a result of the steady influence of the non-militant campaign, a suffragist majority had already been attained by the turn of the century. In local government, even more progress was being made. From the right to vote in school and poor law board elections, to those for local councils, women, albeit mostly single women and ratepayers, were gaining the vote between 1869 and 1894. Women were also increasingly able to stand for election to these boards and councils. Across local government, the principle that women should have the vote and be able to stand for elected office had been conceded. By 1900, there were one million women voters in local government elections. Why were politicians willing to give women the vote for local government, school and poor law board elections and not for parliament? The answer to this question lies in what these bodies did. All were largely concerned with social and domestic matters, matters which male politicians felt more comfortable allowing women to have some say over. National government, however, was concerned with law, defense and foreign and imperial policy. These were areas deemed appropriate only for men. There are other factors to consider as well though. Opponents of women's suffrage in Parliament and the press were skilled at arguing that the suffragists represented only a small minority of middle-class women. They pointed to the fact that large women's organizations, like the Mothers' Union, did not support women's suffrage. The women's suffrage movement also still faced considerable misogyny from men across party and class lines. This opposition occasionally manifested itself in violence, such as that endured by the peaceful suffragists taking part in the 1913 suffrage pilgrimage. The women's suffrage campaign also faced the tactical difficulty of reconciling the reality that reform was likely to be incremental, as it had been with men, with the need to appeal to women of all classes. This meant, in practice, encouraging working-class women to support a campaign for middle-class women to get the vote, in the hope that further reform would follow later. The cause was also held back by each of the main political parties being divided on the women's suffrage question, based largely on uncertainty as to how a new female electorate would vote. The suffragists were clearly aware of the need to reinvigorate the movement, in 1897, a new national organization, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, was formed under the leadership of Millicent Fawcett. Far from having exhausted the argument and given up, the suffragist campaign was making some headway by 1900, and with over 50,000 members at its height, the NUWSS dwarfed Pankhurst's WSPU. What though, tipped the balance in 1918, when women's suffrage was achieved. 